Don't talk about the supply of this forex, uh, of this dollar mostly. So that's number one. The number two is that all the dollars available to the big elephant in the room, which is NNPC, all the dollars that they earn, because it's 90% of our forex, 79% for crude, 11% for gas, all of that money are actually enough to deal with the Nigerians' demand for dollar. You know, would come to the imperfections. The number three is that all the dollars in the system, in the banks, by individuals, in their domiciliary accounts, diaspora, remittance, all of that money on its own are actually enough to deal with the, request, the demand that we have in the economy. What you now have are issues we are going to unravel. But let's first take a look at the big, the big issue, apart from NNPC. The big issue is this. Nigeria, as well as Africa, there's an international division of labor. And that international division of labor places Nigeria and Africa as producers of commodities. And those commodities, the agricultural commodities, raw, crude, they, 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 you know, not even refined petroleum. They, that is processing, value addition. Raw cocoa, raw cassava, raw, everything raw, raw, solid mineral. And so the expectation is that all of this will come to the West to process and then bring it back for us to consume. That is where we have been placed by historical precedents, by international division of labor. So what you find are all the systems and political economy are fighting to perpetuate that, that status quo. Now, you come and say, okay, why, what, do you, what should we do? We have to have progressive value addition as a strategy to be able to add value to our products, what will grow, so that we can eat and substitute for what we are importing. In that way, we'll, we'll have a position on the foreign market to bring in dollars from what things we have added value to. When you don't do that, then what happens is that the things you depend on, which is petroleum commodity, the prices go up and down. You have no control over that price. You suddenly don't have control over those raw prices. Now, that's one. So keep that by the side. The second issue is, uh, why is it hurting us so much? Uh, I, I know that, um, okay, sorry. The second issue about this, the strategies, government strategies, okay, eat what you produce and then produce what you eat. Okay, and then that then means that if you encourage production, then it will come to the level where it will substitute for import. And then the second strategy, the third strategy government has is what they call export-led growth, which means if you produce for export, it has a big chance of creating jobs at home and reducing poverty sustainably and inviting investments into our economy. So those are the things government has been doing. But mm -hmm. what you now have to see is what has gone, what has gone wrong. Now, if you look at the, the issue about illiquidity. The issue about illiquidity is what I have just mentioned. That yes. you know, dollars and monies are sequestered in different sections and then they are, they are not moving. For example, you have, you have regulations that are keeping your domiciliary account dollar and not allowing you to transfer it, to use it to pay because you can say it's dollarizing the economy. But also, so, so what you have is that these monies are there and if you want to use money, dollar, to, to pay for a dollar, they will say it has to be an imported dollar before you can use it. Then two, you have the, uh, the foundation of the, the, the Forex guidance is eligible buyer and seller. And then you have people that say, okay, the bank sees a receivable coming in in dollar. They, they organize and buy it and some buy it at a price you don't know. But they still go to the official market to consume that transaction at a price that is consistent with the going price. There is an arbitrage. There is something between what they are actually buying it for and what they are already sold on the market. You see arbitrage. And you also hear arbitrage being mentioned time and time again. Within the government, multiple government windows, there was arbitrage. And then that means okay. you can buy it and then you can sell it in the black market. No, that has closed. The one is unified, the government one. But because you have ex uh, black market and the things happen, the, the equilibrium price that you are moving because there are more activities now on that cold end of the black market than in the okay. government market. So that's why the simple said, okay, bring back the 41 items into the official market 
and that creates okay. another dynamics because he hasn't well, dealt with some of the issues, but he has done something. So if you want, to, if you want, I can bring out the rest of the things as we begin to uh, talk. Okay. What does it mean, Prof, the information we get that um, in the very near future, the federal government will be uh, automating transactions in the entire foreign exchange market? Automating transactions. So what does that mean? And uh, it says that this will tame wide arbitrage that you spoke about and also that they'll be very strict in uh, punishing speculators. Well, that is, is, well, is a good idea. But the thing is that the devil is in the implementation. Now, what has happened now is, given the background that I laid about the, availab the fact that what we have in the country can actually deal with the need, and then what the PNPC could earn could also deal with the need. So those structures and sequ you know, sequestering of you know, all those things that are happening is what President Lauder is trying to unblock. So what has happened is that two days ago, when the president gave his speech, what he said is that, okay, two things in the speech yesterday, uh, two days ago, was one, there is $10 billion in our line of sight. And then the explanations came that this $10 billion can, can come from demand and supply actions. Demand action is, we're going to have to reduce demand, however way you want to do it. Of course, you also have to reduce overhead costs of NMPC somehow and all that. Then we have to increase supply, so more more will, crude will be produced, and then hopefully we will get more. Then forward sales of, of, of crude and forward sales mm -hmm. of some other assets consistent with our um, Ministry of Finance incorporated moves. You know, so all of those are actually going to help to show up uh, supply of, of forex. So we just work on those. Then then you have the or the, this, the sovereign investment fund is coming up with some, some proposals that they could be able to help in investment flow and all of that. So that's, that's all part of it. But you have two presidential orders that have come in. And those presidential okay. orders are on monetary policy. Uh, of course, some part of fiscal policy, since I've just discussed, enumerated are actually mainly fiscal policy. Now, what that says, one, one of them says, you know what? I want to bring all the dollars that are all over the place in the economy, bring them into the formal economy so that they can, they can, you can unlock the liquidity. The liquidity is that these monies are blocked here and they're not allowed to move. So that's, that has been, that is done. So it now, it is now, what it means is exactly is that you now have a statutory forbearance. And that statute forbearance, you remember that, that was done in 2020 during the COVID where central banks said to the banks, I'm granting you statutory forbearance to waive this, to restructure these loans, to do that, to reduce it to 5% for interest, so all of that, and then later you come back. So that's what is going on now. So we don't know how long it's going to be. And then when you ease the flow, then there may also be issues around money laundering and all of that. Those are some of the challenges that we'll have to deal with. But the fact of the matter, we need to deal with the emergency. This is a state of emergency. The president didn't announce state of emergency, but the measures that are rolling out amount to measures that you could have taken under state of emergency. Now, the second one says, ah, I'm going to uh, allow you to create uh, foreign uh, instruments, currency instruments. That, is, that means that we can raise bonds in dollars here or euro and are you know, denominated in those foreign currencies in our domestic economy. So if people who are interested, if you say, for example, you say, okay, I want to raise $10 billion instrument, and then people in the diaspora, oh, they are 7% interest, they will invest. 8% interest, they will invest. So you get a lot of flow of dollar into the economy for those bonds, and then they bring us, give us all the things that we need. Of course, of course, they should be able to also take them back when they want to cash in and all, all that stuff. Yeah. So that is very important, that we are now creating new instruments um, that could be used to, to pull in dollars. And, and then, of course, they may also want to ask for guarantees of those. So that is a, a very novel one. So when you look at these two coming together, then they would, they would increase liquidity. And then also, when government set up Ministry of Finance Incorporated, the idea in incorporating us, and I happen to be a member of that presidential governing council, the idea is that we have dormant assets we have non-performing assets of government. I'm talking about thousands of those. And so why don't we just leverage on those to unlock liquidity 
sweat some of these equities and then get some liquidity out of it, these assets instead of just keep going on debts uh, uh, instruments you know in debt instruments and debt instruments means your balance sheet is going to be deteriorating every day they're going to be impacting on your on foreign exchange transaction they're going to be asking you to find money to service these debts but it's a different ball game if your instruments are now going to be you know asset based instruments so you are now getting money forward sales of you know people somebody wants 25 year lease on this asset you pay me that 25 years money, I'm not paying interest on it, then it's up to you if you want to go and uh, reactivate it and get your money from there. You are beginning to raise money. And then you are using those assets. You are bringing them back into use. And then you are also looking at investment portfolios around those assets, apart from yes. you know, yes. world-class asset management companies. So all of those are happening together. And it's a physical, that's the physical side. Uh, and then complemented by a monetary side. And they're making sure that there's a handshake. So, you know, on a normal day, I would have said, what the hell is going on? Why is the president uh, waiting into monetary policy to put these instruments out? And then what's CBN going to be doing? So, but when you realize that the president knows what he's doing, actually, he, he, he knows, he has that nose for <laughs> where things have gone wrong and what the courage to attack those. And then certainly he has his two, two right-hand men, you know, the, 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 the erudite uh, finance minister, and then also the central bank governor. So they're all working together. I don't think they will undermine each other. And so I, I will believe that there has been a discussion and the engagement on what has to be done and how quickly it has to be done. I mean, the, the, the monetary policy committee has not been sitting, you know, so quickly. even if they sit every day, it will take them a much longer time to roll out those two executive orders. Uh, that has been given by, by the government. Because they were going to argue that, argue that, argue that. So the president has rolled them out, um, you know, taking these guys into account, and then hope that they will improve the coordination and alignment between monetary and fiscal policy. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Prof. Now, it's one thing, just as you've uh, explained, and thank you very much for that, because um, it sort of will, it, it does shed a bit of light for those who are non-technical uh, uh, economists in the sense that... Um, um, a man like uh, Totolo Mulesi can take for granted. Um, but this matter about um, the central bank, when the, when, uh, the governor, Yamika Doso, was uh, speaking at the recent uh, summit, uh, he, he said that he assured that the Apex Bank, going forward, going forward, uh, will take its objective of price stability very, very seriously. Now, first of all, so the question comes up of, oh, were we lax in that area before? Uh, because the governor says that going forward, we're going to take this whole problem of, you know, ensuring price stability very seriously indeed. Maybe you could explain price stability uh, along with your commentary on the difference between what the central bank used to do and what the Amica Doso has said will now be the order of the day. See, um, there are two core mandates of the central bank. One is um, financial system stability, just to make sure that the financial system is stable and they have uh, prudential guidelines and strict bank supervision and parameters that they use to watch the health of the banking sector. Things like NPR ratios and uh, capital adequacy ratios and non-performing loans and all these other, you know, those other indices. Uh, cash reserve ratio and liquidity ratio and all of that. Then they have the second mandate, which is on price stability. Now, that's where you have all the inflation figures and, and all these other ones, uh, MPI rates and, you know, inter interbank rates, all of those, and forex, of course. Forex is, is, a, is another rate mechanism. And that is where you have the most problem because all the parameters that affect those prices are not within the orbit of the central of monetary policy. So that's, that's number one um, about that constraint. But then also, you also have binding constraints that are structural. For example, insecurity. The central bank doesn't deal with insecurity. Then you have power supply, infrastructure, the deficit. I mean, our stock of infrastructure is only at 5% of the GDP. Most countries are over 80%. In South Africa, 80%. And then we're so far behind. We have to continue and continue to invest in infrastructure, but we have to invest in such a way that it is capable of repaying the money. 
That's why you need a lot of PPPs. You need to do cost-benefit analysis. You need to make sure that you are targeting the infrastructure to the economy, to the economic uh, opportunities and clusters, so that they can, you can have a return. And then bringing in, uh, pri leveraging private sector. The second, the medium-term development plan says we want to borrow 350 trillion naira, but only 50 will come from all levels of government. Private sector, come, go and find 300 trillion. That tells you how important the private sector is in this equation. You have to leverage them. You have to make, bring incentives. Private sector responds to incentives, not to the things you say. The incentives you give to them is what they respond to. But you also have to watch it because, for example, when, you, when we, are, we are having issues with our waivers, uh, of course, you know, duty waivers and all of that, and you know, there are issues, real mm -hmm. issues there. Okay. Now, where do we go from there uh, in terms of... Um, uh, the, the, the dynamics of the, 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 the policy. And there's the third one. Apart from, I've talked about the price stability, I've talked about financial system stability. And there's the third one. Central banks have an added role to promote sustainable economic development. Now, that's where the intervention comes in. The domestic finance intervention comes in because of that role. And let me tell you why that role is necessary. Uh, they may be, it may be open to abuse at some point, but it is necessary because we run a market economy. We're not running a command economy. A market economy means that we're all there we're hoping that market forces will resolve things. You've seen it. Market forces are not resolving the foreign exchange. Market forces are not resolving the, the asymmetries in lending. For example, there are many sectors that are starved, especially the real sector, that are starved of funds because the banks and the financial system don't see them as viable. I, I want to, one point there is agriculture. So central bank has to step in to de-risk agriculture. That's why I set up oh. NISA and gave me $500 million, which they haven't even touched, where they borrowed against those, and then de-risk agriculture by 80% and all of that. And the central oh, bank I, also came and said, oh, okay, you know what? I have 32.5% of the money from these commercial banks in my vault, over $6 trillion. That is not earning them any interest. So you know what? I want to. I want you to target your lending to the real sector. So come and take this money, but lend them over a medium term because they're not lending medium term to the real sector, and then give them nine nine percent interest and moratorium. That is a special grace that they are giving to to, oh. to commercial bank to come and take this money and lend and target it to area that is, uh, is that is weak, not performing. And then you saw what happened during COVID. And then during the recession that followed with it, where resources were targeted. Uh, for example, I, I remember that I argued that if you don't, I, I people pardon, are prof. losing their jobs. I, if you don't, excuse me, forgive me for butting in, Prof. Um, I, I'm going to we're, we're going to return to this that you're explaining, especially this question of uh, market forces. I'd like to ask a question there. But in the meanwhile, uh, Mr. George Inikeja has called in. Good morning. Thank you for holding on a bit. Good morning, Uncle Yori, good and morning. Uh, good morning to the Prof. Yes. Uncle Yori, uh, uh, can you permit me to uh, say something about yesterday's uh, program? I made an observation, and I thought I should, uh, I should make it known. Yesterday, we were, uh, Nigerians from all over the world were calling this program to celebrate the victory the country had against uh, some frosters from, 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 from outside this country. And then one person called from the UK to say something that I said should be brought to the fore. He said he would have loved the frosters to win the case, if not for the, uh, his concern for the poor masses in Nigeria. I noticed, Uncle Yori, this same color. During the uh, elections, the build up to the elections, he called this uh, parliament on three occasions, venting his hatred for a uh, uh, then candidate Tinubu, he vowed that Tinubu will not win that election. But he forgot that the will of men is different from the will of God. Okay. For me, yeah, I, I, I remember that. That, that was the most unpatriotic. I, I beg your pardon for, yes. for interrupting, Mr. George. Thank you very much. I do remember uh, that was Ade who called him from the UK and saying that he would have wished Nigeria had lost, but for the uh, uh, the, the poor men. Uh, thank you very much. But, Mr. George, thank you very much for bringing it up. Indeed, it wasn't the most patriotic thing we've heard on the program, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, I, I didn't want to break the flow 
of the explanation that we're getting. I I'm sure as a business person yourself, uh, did you have an input you wanted to add to this question of the uh, worsening forex uh, illiquidity? Oh, uh, Mr. George, are you still there? Well, well. Okay, he, he's gone, unfortunately. Um, yeah, um, well, I, I didn't want us to break the flow because we were getting a sort of a, 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 an understanding of all the uh, factors that are going on in the, you know, the whole monetary financial system, such as uh, our guest, uh, Professor Ken, if he is explaining to us. Now, to return to the question of, um, um, you know, um, you were explaining market forces. And uh, I, I was going to, uh, maybe I should, we can continue that by my observing that oftentimes we hear experts say that, well, uh, when it comes to monetary policies like this, you can't leave everything to market forces. Uh, they expect that government needs to intervene, although it doesn't want to make a habit of it. But uh, again, could you sort of uh, enlighten a bit in that whole area where some are saying that market forces, good as they are, but you have to intervene. What, what, what's the meaning, uh, the understanding behind that position? Now, the thing is this. There is an imbalance between the supply of Forex and the demand for Forex. Let me give you an example of what is going on. From 2014, NNPC used to send $3 billion every month to CBN. Okay? But now, they only send 10% of that 3 billion, about 300 million. And if you look at NNPC, they earn 90% of the forex, 79% crude, 11% gas, and then 10% is all that is within the purview of the central bank. But then even then, that's where remittance is significant there. And then that's you know, going away into the black market and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. CBN needs 2 billion every month dollar to settle i mean we have to pay for interest on loans that are denominated in dollars we have to service outstanding payments like uh, areas and uh, airlines and all of that and then there are other things that they have to use money not dollars for but it gets only about 300 million from instead of 2 billion and then you have markets you go to the market importers are looking for 4.6 billion dollars a month to import things add these two that gives you six point uh, something billion, six point eight billion, that they are looking for six point six billion that are being looking for, and then against what receipt? The receipt is so low, so small. That's imbalance. You cannot, in a situation where you have this imbalance, say I'm floating naira, <laughs> you can float, and then you will see where it's going to fall to. What happens is that you have to manage it, and you manage it by intervening gradually. And you know sometimes you will intervene, but also bear in mind that when you intervene. That is actually subsidy that you are doing. They are subsidizing the forest market. And then you have to always take that decision to what level of intervention because you still need to intervene in production. You don't, you don't uh, um, subsidize consumption. That's the idea. That's the question about petroleum subsidy. You don't subsidize consumption because you are paying for somebody's job out there. But if you subsidize production like agriculture and all of that, then you are creating jobs, keeping them here. And using your own feeling, feeling yourself. So that's a, that's a the big idea. So you always have to be weighing th those things at each point in the policy frame. So that's 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 that. Now, uh, thank you, Prof. Um, the question of the new uh, guidelines, the new regulations, indeed, uh, the uh, the the two executive orders that the president uh, signed uh, last week or so. All of this. Uh, especially the one that interests me is where all foreign exchange, wherever it's coming from, will be, will be seen as it were. Uh, you have one view of the total supply of foreign exchange uh, as opposed to what's happening now. Now, I, I understand that bit, but how well do you think um, the compliance will do? Because you have banks in every bank, just about every bank. Let me speak about Lagos where I'm based here so I know about that. You want Forex. It is the bank itself that will tell you rather than sell to you. Say, look, go outside there and ask for, you know, uh, ask for Malam so, 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 and uh, he will deal with you. Uh, does that factor into this? Uh, because 
that certainly is not part of the, what government knows about, uh, you know, in a forensic sort of a way. So, and it's happening in all banks. There's no bank that does not have a currency dealer attached to it who's sitting, you know, quietly outside, knowing full well that the very banking officials are going to send customers his way. Is, is that an important part of this? Yeah. That's what, these are the asymmetries I was talking about. Um, you have, as I have explained to you, how our domiciliary accounts, which are in dollars and euro and all that, there are restrictions on what you can use that to pay for. And then you can collect dollars and go and put in there. But when you want to use it to settle some bills, they are, you are restricted. They will say, yes. okay, bring only the one inflow that came from abroad that you could use. Then, so you've got all that. And then you have the transactions going on in the IMTO, you know, the International Money Transfer Organizations, that are collecting remittances and all kinds of inflows, and they're using Naira to settle the people rather than give the people the Naira, the dollar, so that they can sell it freely in the market. You've got yeah. all that going. Then you have the banks themselves earning their own dollars because some, a lot, quite a lot of the banks have foreign, foreign accounts and foreign uh, branches and all of that and earning and trading and earning dollars. Uh, and those dollars are in their vaults and the other ways that they earn dollars as well. And I've just mentioned to you, even on the eligible buyer and the eligible seller, you can do a deal with somebody that you know is bringing in some dollars after their export and then you buy their dollars on some rate, which is known to both of you. And then you still go to the official window to fulfill all righteousness by selling at 800 or 790, whatever. And then there's, but all of that is illegal. Imagine there that nobody knows. But it is all illegal. Of, there's so many now, such examples. I, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Prof. But this is, let me bring in Wale, who has called in from Germany. Good morning, Wale. Uh, good morning, Uncle Yuri. Thank you, sir. Thank you for okay, calling. Okay, I'm calling for the first time. Oh, we're delighted to have you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. You got a question for Prof. Okay, I just want to, uh, to quickly jump in into the actual problem uh, we actually have in Nigeria as regards to foreign exchange. Uh, the actual problem is just the control. And uh, actually, I'm actually into this business, uh, and I know where the problem is. Uh, sitting down in the office and making that decision uh, is just the actual problem. So what the new CBN government, what they need to do is just get to the street. No matter billions of dollars they are going to pump into that market, I'm so sure everything is going to be consumed within one week. Now, let's ask ourselves, can you go to a bank now and just request for $1,000? Can you pay with your debit card anywhere in the world? This is not possible. If they want the rates to drop down, if all banks in Nigeria, they, they, they publish now that, okay, you can now use your debit card to pay up to $4,000 in a month, the price will drop down to seven fifty. And also, if you want to pay school fees, if you want to pay for your Netflix, anything you want to pay, that restriction that was placed, that is the problem. And I'm actually into uh, cryptocurrency uh, trading. And that's where the problem actually started from. We trade nothing less than two million US dollars daily on cryptos, and we help people to pay for RMB. Tell the CBN government to go to Alaba International Market on a daily basis to be going to trade fairs, to be going to all those markets where we have importers. Let them have access to the money directly. That is the solution. Or sitting down in the office and making decisions. No matter what they pump into the market, I will, I will tell you that the, all our banks, they are part of it. The money is the go back to all the bull exchange, and that is what is happening. Okay. And the issue of influence, let me just uh, say this now. If you receive, let's say, $10,000 inflow now, go to, to, to your bank account, go to your bank, and ask them that you want to buy 1000 They will tell you, the money is not available. That's well, thank you very much uh, for calling in, Wally, on that. Uh, Prof, I'll take a break now, but as soon as I come back, I'll get your, your views on Wally's uh, submission, and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Stay with us, please. We'll be right back. Every major news story is with many perspectives. 
layered with different levels of impact. Hello. What time did this happen? We will be right there. At TVC News, we follow the big and major news, gathering the facts, witnessing the outcome. I am here live at the aftermath of the approval of a new national minimum wage. The TV station of the year, not just for breaking news, but for being first, fair and accurate. TVC News, first with breaking news. It's not your regular show. Is an online interactive session where we share my views on the everyday issues that cut across politics, security, health, current affairs, governance, and so much more. I am passionate about our country. I choose to support any conversation geared towards building a better Nigeria. I am Babajide Koladio Tutoju. Join me every Saturday on TVC News YouTube channel as I discuss Nigeria and the world at large on the show Issues with Jide. Lagos is the most visited state in Africa as the fifth largest economy on the continent. Covering the state and its government is no me feat, it's a busy beat. We go beyond the cutting of tapes to travel in far into the deep. I want to thank the Lagos State Government for the healthcare facility. To bring stories that cut across all spectrums. A greater Lagos shall be ours. We tell you stories that define our collective well-being as Lagosians. Amadido Jasalamadini, I live in Lagos, inside Lagos. Okay, welcome back. And uh, our guest is Professor Ken Ife. Um, he's helping us to understand the worsening uh, forex uh, illiquidity that we have on our hands. And in the meantime, when we were on break, um, Sonny in the UK called in. Uh, good morning to you, Sonny. Oh, um, for, for, for now, what, what I like to contribute is that, um, like the prof said, it's about the law of demand and supply. However, it, it looks simple, but it's not that very straightforward. Um, the, the current situation we are in today in Nigeria is more um, around the confidence in our economy, okay. which is causing people, like you, you see basic people now, even if you have 100,000 naira today or 100 million, what people quickly do is to go and see how they convert it to dollars, and they just touch it somewhere. And... It, when you look at value system, it's about the money flowing from one hand to another person. The, the government of the day is making effort not just to sit and uh, continue with the way things have been. So there have been efforts to actually solve problems. However, to solve that problem is definitely is going to cost almost all of us one thing or the other. We need to make some shifts. So what I'm going to say to the prof, especially having been involved in some of the government policies in the past, as he has brilliantly explained some of these issues, is that what is the government going to be doing in addressing this confidence in the system such that we can still keep our Naira without having to worry that, oh, it's going to suddenly depreciate. Because we just have to tell ourselves this truth, that it is the pain of the problem of skyrocketing rate of the exchange rate that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonny, for holding on and for the question. Uh, Prof, uh, the, whole, the whole matter of our confidence in the economy that he brought up. Yeah, well, first of all, let me deal with the previous one. The, what he was speaking to is to, they were speaking to liberalization of the foreign exchange market and then also to the fact that you need to have a higher degree of transparency and uh, 
and, and, and of course accountability, but more to do with transparency and openness in those transactions. Uh, then when you bring in the issue of speculation, if the bank that you went to says that the, you asked for $1,000, uh, they say they don't have it, it is because they are expecting and speculating that the, the value of the dollar will rise. So they are going to make more money by holding that dollar and selling it at a much higher price in the next week or so. But if the liberalization has allowed dollars to come into the market and people are buying and selling and the prices are coming down, when you go to the bank, they'll say to you, because they know that if you don't sell today at this price, tomorrow it could even get lower and lower and lower. So they lose money. Because don't forget, they bought, this, they bought these dollars. And that's the same applies with other individuals. So you beat speculation. Speculation is a very dangerous thing. And what has not helped us is that our, our own financial strength is open there. JP Morgan has said, oh, Nigeria only has uh, 3.5 uh, billion, that the rest of them are committed. And then uh, when Singapore had this problem, they refused to tell anybody what their the forest is. They were fighting. Because once the speculator don't know the size of your armory, it is a war. He says it's a financial war. That's what Singapore predicted. This is financial war. I won't tell you my secret. My secret is how much I have in the reserve. So they won't tell you. So they were fighting speculators. So they don't even know how much they have in the reserve. So they started selling their dollar and bringing it. And that's how they defeated them. So with everything about us is in the open now. You know, we've seen that it's only 3.5. So really, well, it doesn't have that money. Once within a month, it goes and all that stuff. So, but not, that, not to say that we are going to go back on, on our transparency. But, but it's just for you to know that you are fighting an animal that has a lot in his armor. And so when you open up the space and there's transparency and there's a flow, a good flow, and you have this instrument, domestic uh, foreign instru uh, instrument that are going to attract this one, then you're going to be sounding a serious alarm to the speculator. These monies are going to go down. The rate will go down. So better bring out your money and start you know, transacting. <laughs> so that's, what, that's how it's going to play out. Okay. Um... And, um, well, now, has anything been uh, sort of uh, uh, put in view uh, to, to, that can affect this beyond what you said essentially, which is about we need to increase production at the end of the day uh, so that we ourselves can earn something? Uh, by, by, by which I mean, you would have thought that it now becomes illegal if a bank is withholding, you know, dollars that you are yours, that, are, that is in their account, uh, in your accounting with, with them, but because they themselves are speculating. Uh, anything about the president's uh, two executive orders and all the new policies being put, being brought to bear, anything about all of that that will make all of this uh, sort of illegal? But be before you go on that question, Prof, Ada has called in. Let me uh, put Ada on. Good morning, Ada calling in from Joss. Ada in Joss. Good morning, ma'am. Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Ayori. And good morning to Professor Ken. Um, Mr. Ayori, I don't call it from, I don't know, call it from those two states. I'm not an economist, but I don't think it needs a rocket science to know what is the problem, like Paul said. The government should cut off those expenses that involve the spending of the dollar. In other words, government should reduce traveling abroad, and where the president or whomsoever has to make that change, the number of aides, officials, or what have you, must be drastically reduced. Government should focus on possible product substitutions that will help to cut down the use of the dollar. Another aspect is to address, our, uh, 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 to fix our hospitals and uh, our tertiary institutions so that it will discourage medical and educational tourism, respectively. All these ventures involve paying in dollars, which contributes in putting uh, the pressure on the Naira. Now, the national assembly are not helping matters. Those cars, even if uh, we, I don't want to quarrel about the cars, they say they, 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 they are supposed to buy the 160 or 50 million cars or whatever for each person. As if they are buying those cars in Nigeria, it has been a different bargain. Dollars. What are we talking about? We are going to Sokoto to look for what is in our Sokoto. We are the problem. We have a, 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 I mean, a pension for foreign goods. There's no magic, there's no bank money that can do that. It can't do that. There's no magic. It's talking money into the system. It, it, it just has good. Uh, pouring water in a basket, you know. We have to uh, move away from uh, consumption to production. That is a problem. That is a simple economy behind this thing, you know. You, you, can you imagine? That we, 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 we don't encourage the use of uh, made in Nigeria goods. 
everything. I don't. I think if they can borrow a bit from uh, Toludo of Anambra State, uh, what what he wears in Nigeria, they can't use it in all his uh, stuff. Everything they are using, making use of the one produced by Inosel, Inosel and all that. That's the way to go. But we keep on, you know, uh, talking about the policies. We come back and talk with. Uh, uh, things that can grow the economy. There's no magic that central bank manager can do. Remember very well I said it. There's no magic. All the less of Nigeria, All right, thank you very much, uh, Ada, for calling in. Okay, Prof. She, she her commentary she added on top of um, uh, what I was sort of exploring before. Maybe you could combine the two. She raised a very very critical point, which is the import-dependent economy, which is fed by an appetite for foreign goods. Um, when you have an import-dependent economy, which fits into the design of our uh, special international division of labor, what happens is actually more than what you can imagine. First of all, you are exposed to every global headwind. Every global headwind, not just financial headwinds. Because you are on a transmission belt, your economy is on the transmission belt of every conceivable global headwind. So if you have a health crisis like COVID-19, it will sweep you. If you have a trouble in a Russia and Ukraine, it will affect you. Even though you produce oil and gas that Russia is producing, but because you are import dependent on Europe, Europe, for example, that 40% of their energy, gas, is coming from Russia then their price rises are going to affect you because you now bring in those imported inflation. Even though it is the America subprime crisis, mortgage crisis, what's it going to do with you? But it affects you. And that's what our bank suffered in 2008. So you have all these exposures because it's an import dependent economy. And the only source you have is a commodity that is price you can determine, you can control. So we have to have both actions on the demand and supply side. And you also saw in the measure that were outlined by the minister that they are acting on the demand side as well by saying, okay, cut down on the, on the expenditure, uh, cut down on, on... I think you even have to look at staff, for example. Because NABC is carrying a huge dead weight. You are keeping staff of four refineries and you don't even get any refinery working. But if you had encouraged modular refinery, they would have absorbed some of those staff to reduce your costs. So you have a lot of costs over overhang that you know that they have to continue and then you also have the thing that you are talking about uh, senators and other people wanting to buy this kind of cars you could have done the nigerian assembly car or whatever to include mm -hmm. the specification but also they are also demanding uh, forex so all of this demand 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 could be curtailed and then okay if you look at another one almost 80 percent of the manufacturing capacity in nigeria and manufacturing was being deserts depend on foreign imported raw materials. If you look at the pharmaceutical, it's about 95%. Active pharmaceutical yeah. ingredients that are imported, they just put water or syrup or, 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 or starch to compound tablets. Importing everything. So what that means is a continuous charge on your foreign exchange. And then, so you must deal with that as part of your import substitution or, or backward integration and see how it was done with cement. But I'm just saying, well, you know what, I'm not going to allow you to import license, uh, screen clinkers anymore unless you show me your factory. And I have already, I also predict, I said, I suggested that. Tell you those five big oil majors who have tank farms and who, have, who are importing uh, the PMS and exporting the crude. Tell them to come and show you their modular refinery before you give them license to continue to produce. Instantly, within six months, five modular refineries will come in our stream because they themselves have needed to refine their products will come from tank farm. From there, they can All export right. it or it could enter into the national distribution system. And then you mm -hmm. give them the license to continue to do this. So any practical okay. measures will have success. One moment, Prof. Um, one moment, Prof. Go I ahead pardon. Again, I'm sorry for butting in, but Ibrahim in Jigawa State has called in. Good morning, Ibrahim. Good morning, Mr. Yori. Thank you for calling in. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Uh, pertaining to the topic... Under this question, the financial crisis the country finds itself in, I want to contribute, I want to say that uh, I think we are our own enemies. Hmm. We are not doing anything to help ourselves. As one of the speakers rightly said, we are a consumer nation. And we have this 
uh, lavish appetite for anything foreign. And uh, our leaders, too, are not happy matters. They have this appetite for anything foreign. Uh, the recent, um, the recent uh, purchase of uh, uh, exotic vehicles for the National Assembly members, I think it's a typical example. That is a kind of capital flight too. You don't buy those exotic cars with local currency. And in a situation where we have a, a, a drastic deficit in our foreign exchange, I see no reason why our lawmakers will still go ahead to request for those exotic foreign cars when we have car manufacturing industries in the country. At least that money can be channeled to one of the companies producing cars in Nigeria. Okay. At least there All right. won't be that capital flight. Indeed. Well, and thank, thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim, uh, calling in from uh, Jigawa State. Uh, uh, Professor, if a, uh, it is Ada who started this particular trend, and it's been picked up there by a Ibrahim. Um, and I think the, the sort of principle is that every little bit counts. And uh, you spoke about appetites. If our appetite is such that we need dollars to, to satisfy these cravings, that we have um, for all these things that cost dollar to buy. Uh, do, do you think, Prof, that our whole national attitude to these, these things, we are not yet conducting ourselves as if we are in an emergency, albeit a, a financial emergency, where, uh, for instance, they, they made the example, I know that the, the cars that they want to buy in the National Assembly, well, you might say it's a drop in the ocean, but if the attitude was right, then that kind of a thing might be anathema in the sense that it's not in this time. People have brought up the matter about uh, uh, Anambra State and, uh, you know, Soludo and uh, him dealing with, um, you know, a, a national assembler, although I think manufacturer is uh, the name that they would prefer. But you've also said that that has its own very, uh, you know, its own foreign exchange content as well. But so I guess what I'm asking, Prof, is, do you think this, the attitude is not quite right yet? We don't have a sense of urgency that we can't just be spending dollars anyhow, not at this time. Well, I, let me stick to the example you give on automobile. One is policy can change a lot of things. And I remember in the first speech of the president, uh, President Tinubu, he alluded to opening up credit, you know, credit uh, 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 creation. And I thought that that would have a more far-reaching effect. Because when you come to that, because Mr. Tata used this in 1981 when I first went to London for my PhD. So what he did was to allow the big boys with dollars in the, you know, the petrol dollars from Saudi Arabia, all that area to enter into our uh, 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 credit system. Now, so what happens is that you can go and have lease purchase or higher purchase. The, one of the big challenges in our economy is that if you want to buy a car, you have to buy a 100% cash. You buy a house 100%. And then, you know, and then your specific servants not to have a car, they have to go and do what they have to do to get that bulk money to pay for these things. And they must have the house. So, so you can see how you encourage it by the kind of policy that you have. So when you have that um, credit, now what is this? Look at six stay at your automobile. We import 400,000 second hand cars into Nigeria through Kotonu alone. And those cars are paid for in dollars. They don't get paid them in Naira when they are bringing it from Germany or America. No, they paid in dollars. And so they are part of the demand for dollar. Then you come back and say, all right, you know what? What's the manufacturing capacity of uh, our local car assemblers? Let's say about 10,000 cars a, a month, a, a year. They can increase to 100,000 cars 10 times, 10 fold, if you allow credit to flow to them. In other words, if that credit is flowing to the manufacturer, and if you go to them and the innocent say, okay, please, I'm putting down 10%, then the credit 
take over and pay the, the manufacturer that 90 percent and then so for, he's giving him dollar for the next import he's going to do of spares and then now this guy pays back this money over three years or four years you have destroyed the second hand market because next year he will bring this car back and trade it for a new car then the man producing the assembly car will increase tenfold nigerians will be ten times more people are employed Simply because the credit is not flowing to consumers that will use it to go and buy food and, and cause more inflation. The credit is flowing to the manufacturer that is manufacturing. You are building manufacturing capacity. You are building, uh, what do you call it, value addition capacity. And then you are making sure you are targeting it to substitute for the import of 400,000 cars coming in into the country, second-hand cars. So you achieve you know, a double barrier. You achieve two things at the same time. Just by attack, by using policy uh, to, to attack it. In, indeed, and and I think I, I very recently the president was saying I think it was at that very um, economic summit meeting that uh, by first quarter of next year he expects one of the um, credit um, uh, programs that he's been thinking about uh, thinking about to sort of take off. Uh, it escapes my mind now exactly which one of them. I, was it about uh, education or something like that? So, but your explanation is um, uh, on how credit could benefit uh, is, is very well taken. Uh, but as to the question of, um, I don't know, did you want to comment on whether, how, how urgently, uh, the, 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 the mental psyche, uh, everybody still, it's, it's like it will be okay, it will be okay, and indeed it will be, it will be okay. But it's like we're not going through any kind of um, per periods of um, restricting ourselves because of what is happening now. Life is pretty much continuing as usual. Uh, and I think, I think it's the, one of the points that Ada made, and I think someone else who called in, was it the uh, gentleman who called in from Germany? Um, that whole matter about there's nothing to show in the way we go about our lives that we have an urgency on our hands. It's like people are thinking that it's going to be okay. In the meantime, we can more or less continue the way we are. Or... Is that a misplaced what, notion? What, what, the pres See, what the president did not say, I hereby declare a set of emergency on Forex. He didn't say that. <laughs> but the measure that he's rolling out are exactly yeah. what would happen yeah. if he was to say that. So he's actually oh. doing it. It's only in food security that he said, I have a set of emergency on food security. Yeah, he has actually, he's doing that. So he's invoking doctrine of necessity. He's bringing in statutory forbearance on many of those uh, uh, macro prudential measures and then all that capital account code is bringing the uh, happening everything that needs to happen is happening right now you didn't want to just call it instead of emergency on forex no but it's happening for a presidential order executive orders to come one after another on monetary mm -hmm. policy and then you've got them also on, on fiscal policy and then you have them coming together that is possible because otherwise i would have said what the hell is president trying to do is he trying to control an independent institution within the central bank? But it is an emergency. So that's why he's having all this forbearance. Forbearance means you're suspending something for a little while, and then for we don't know how long, and then you are trying to see if you can correct the situation, because we are, we are, we are in serious trouble in that arena. All right. Then. And, you know, Prof, so, it, so he needed that bank kind bank. of action, and that's the action he's taking. Indeed. All right, then. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a fine place to leave it, Professor Ken Ife. Uh, macro economist and uh, public affairs analyst. Thank you very much for the enlightenment you bring to the subject this morning on our program. So that's our program. Please join us tomorrow for a fresh edition. I am Yori Folani. Bye-bye for now. I'm here to rule forever. And nothing can stop me. That woman is wicked. <laughs> oh, I love you all. Get lost. Ratchet. Poor thing. She must be my parent. The only power respect I have, I did by doing everything. That low budget Beyonce. The following is a paid presentation by ShopX TV. Are you worried about the safety and security of your home at night? Do you wish to know when intruders come close to your home? 
Or do you want to protect what matters to your family from anywhere at any time? What if there was a convenient, affordable way to keep surveillance in your home without having to worry about wires, installations, or heavy light bills? Introducing the incredible Sidebulb HD Cam, the robotic 360 degree two way talk camera with action tracking technology. Sidebulb is the ultimate solution for discreet and powerful surveillance. It's so easy to install, and the app lets you rotate and view the video from your Sidebulb in real time from any smartphone. You can drop in from anywhere and check in with our two-way talk technology. Talk and listen at the same time. Hello, Mommy. Hey, sweetie. I'll be home soon, okay? Sidebulb's advanced tracking technology locks onto motion and tracks in real time. Set the siren alarm to go up when motion is detected and keep intruders away. Check in on your home while you're away. Make sure the kids got home safely. Interact with visitors at your doorway or surprise a trespasser. Surveillance in a light bulb. I was amazed at the 360 degree rotation. It gives me a full view of my house and I can check in on my kids. The footage is clear and the night vision is so impressive. The best part, I can add multiple side bulbs for a complete home surveillance. I really like my sidebar. It's so easy to use. I just downloaded the app, I put it on my phone, and I add it up and run in about three minutes. Traditional surveillance systems are bulky, expensive, and difficult to install. But with Sidebulb HD Cam's innovative design, installation is as fast as changing a light bulb, and it's made for indoor and outdoor surveillance. The Sidebulb HD Cam is now available in Nigeria exclusively from ShopX TV. You could be paying up to 200,000 Naira for an indoor and outdoor security system that doesn't fully secure your home. But call the number on your screen now and get the Sidebulb HD Cam for just 45,000 Naira and get peace of mind. And that's not all. If you call now, we'll give you an extra sight bulb at no extra cost. That means you buy one and get one free for 45000 naira. But wait, there's more. If you order now, you get the sight bulb HD cam delivered to you for free wherever you are in Nigeria. So, call the number on your screen now or visit our website to place your order while stock lasts. The proceeding was a paid presentation brought to you by ShopX TV. A deadly syndicate. An overdue vengeance. A sacrifice of blood. And thank you for joining us on TVC Midday News. We begin with security matters as the Nigerian army is set to move and disperse recovered unexploded ordnance. This is contained in a press statement made available to TVC News and signed by Acting Deputy Director Army Public Relations 81 Division to Nigerian Army Lieutenant Colonel Olabisi Olali Konayeni. The clearance from the site of the 2002 Keja Cantonment bomb blast will commence on Tuesday, 27th October 2023. The coordinator of exercise, Clint Swip, had revealed that the exercise had reached an uh, advanced stage, resulting in the recovery of various calibers of unexploded ordnances, which will have to be professionally disposed. 
The disposal will be at Uwode Agility Ogo State on Friday, the 27th, October 2023, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Meanwhile, the Chief of Defense Staff General Christopher Musa says the armed forces remain dedicated to ensuring democracy thrives in the country. He says that we will not fold their hands to any threat to undermine peace and stability. The remarks came during a visit to the armed forces complex by the Minister of Defense. See for the CN reports. It's the first visit to the armed forces complex by the Minister of Defense and his subordinate minister. The expectations are high as the minister starts their engagement at the defense headquarters. We know there have been a series of uh, challenges within the sub-region where we have a number of coups all over. We want to assure Mr. President and to you all, sir, that the armed forces of Nigeria is fully committed to democracy. He also highlights the items required to keep the armed forces up and doing in the face of evolving security challenges. The robust and modernization equipment of the armed forces of Nigeria, that I know we have taken up even with Mr. President. We want to say thank you. Armed forces is doing the best it can, but we are limited due to uh, debt of funding. But we want to thank you very much for your commitment in ensuring that you make we present our cases to the president. The Minister of Defense conveys the goodwill of the president of the country as well as the task before the military. You are also aware that uh, the president never turned you down or never turned us down. The president, be it equipments, be it improving funding, be it accommodation for personnel, training of personnel, special funds for medical, and all what you have said. I'm sure the president will do it. And the focus shifts to the army headquarters where senior officers are at alert in the operations room. But this is just to follow the formality and the procedure, having you present with us at the army headquarters this afternoon. I have listened to the challenges and agree on you totally on ways and means to combat the challenges. The visit is meant to spur the military to live up to its constitutional mandate of protecting the territorial integrity of the country. See Fon ACN TVC News, Abuja. Still talking security training to improve our law enforcement officers dispense justice has begun in Abuja. It is meant to identify how to resolve Failings in the administration of the criminal justice system. There's more in the foreign reports. The administration of justice in Nigeria has been fraught with challenges. The problems often stem from the inability of various agencies to properly carry on with their roles. This forum at the police headquarters is meant to draw attention to the problem with the aim of finding solution. It is our hope that the totality of these experiences, the observed challenges inherent in the procedures and an evaluation of how they affect average citizens in their daily quest for justice in the country will form part of robust discussions by participants in this training. The officials from the various agencies appreciate the need to collaborate in improving justice delivery. Um, agencies of government, that are responsible for law enforcement. Some of them have little knowledge around it, some have a lot, but creating a convivial environment like this, it's good for sharing. At the end of the day, the organizers hope to get all the agencies on the same page. 